As we continue on in integrated rangeland management with learning the tools of grazing management, today we're going to start to talk about grazing methods and plans. We're going to focus on the basic elements of a grazing method. The term that most commonly is used is grazing system. I don't really like that term grazing system because it implies that it's some recipe that you have to follow line by line. I think the idea of a grazing method is a better um, concept because really if you know anything about livestock grazing there's more exceptions to the rule than there are rules. So today's lecture we're going to talk a little bit about some of those guidelines that help you set the right methods. Okay remember we've had this uh, this slide before but you're as a range manager you have a certain set of natural and human resources. The actual decisions that you can make in terms of grazing management include the livestock species the number of animals stocking rate which we discussed previously and then this grazing methods concept the grazing method is something that controls season of grazing season of rest and the duration of grazing those are the elements of a grazing method or grazing system so we're going to talk about these elements today again grazing principles are based on the fact that you can manipulate animal species stocking rate or how many animals when animals graze, which is the grazing season, and then how long animals are grazed or rested, which is that duration of grazing. So those last two points, when to graze or not to graze, how long to graze or rest, those are elements of a grazing method. A couple terms that we have to clear up before we move into a further discussion is to distinguish between deferment and rest. These are quite different actually, especially in systems that have seasonal greenness, and that is that a deferment is any time that you don't graze from the initiation of growth in the spring through the period where the plant produces seed. So a period of non-grazing during just a part of the growing season. When I use the term of deferment, I'm really talking about that part of the grazing system. I'm sorry, that part of the grazing season, which is from the initiation of growth through seed set. Um, rest is a little different. Rest is the deferment um, for at least one whole calendar year, one whole year. So that would be rest. Deferment is just a period of the year, generally from, from initiation to seed set, and rest is a whole year. A couple other terms that to distinguish in this idea of what is a grazing season and growing season. Um, some systems or some methods are year-long especially in the tropics and subtropics. So when you get in the southern part of the US and down into the tropics um, those systems are usually year-long. Animals are grazed all year out on the range. When you get into seasonal climates, such as in the temperate region where we have winter and you know spring and summer being very different, where growth just happens spring, summer, fall, that's when you would have a seasonal grazing pattern. Uh, also sometimes in the uh, tropics where there's very distinct dry wet cycles, you may not have much grazing at all in the dry cycle. And grazing during the growing season usually occurs in seasonal systems, or at least that's what we pay the most attention to. Another term to clear up is this idea of rotational. Uh, rotational systems or, or methods are when the grazing system controls the period of grazing, or vice versa, you control the period of rest. Um, thinking about grazing a season and growing season is rather important also. I, I will normally talk about grazing season but realizing that, that uh, on rangelands the grazing season is generally longer than the growing season because we're going to use vegetation well past the time when the plant gets dormant. So one of the elements of most rangeland grazing methods is that we stockpile forage for use in the dormant season. And it frequently involves the use of biomass during the per peak growing season but, but stockpiling some of that into dormancy. Often when you're talking about uh, grazing in tame pastures, um, sometimes the grazing season will match the growing season. So we end up using those tame pastures while they're growing and then maybe stockpile a little, shortening up the grazing si system again, the time that you're grazing during the growing season instead of be beyond. It varies depending on the manager, but uh, usually on rangelands we, we graze well past the end of the growing season and in tame pastures the growing season often matches the grazing season. A little more detail on grazing methods. Uh, grazing methods are practices that manipulate the grazing and the periods of deferment and rest. So keep your eye on the ball. Those are the three things that we manage in grazing methods. 
these the systems or the methods are designed on the idea that grazing has an effect on individual plant levels. So most of the what we know about grazing methods was designed by looking at individual plants, which has some sort of inherent problems. But again, we know that plants respond to grazing differently in different seasons. So uh, the seasons of grazing in, in grazing methods is based on individual plant response to grazing during different seasons. And then we also know that the frequency of defoliation is important. So we control the length of a grazing period in a grazing method in hopes of affecting how frequently an, a plant is, is defoliated. Okay, now going to that timing. There's a couple ways to look at the timing. Um, timing of when grazing occurs is very important. If you think about the season or phenological stage of the plants, so the season of the year or the phenological stage, plants tend to be most resistant to defoliation in periods of dormancy. They're more resistant to removal of biomass when the biomass is dormant than when it's growing. And then during the growing season, we'll talk in a minute how that varies throughout the growing season or throughout the phenological stages of the plant. Another important thing about the timing of grazing is to make sure that there's enough time for recovery. So we know that, that defoliation is going to have some detrimental effects on a plant. Yes, it can have some beneficial effects also, but we know that it's going to affect the plant. Um, and we need to make sure that there's enough opportunity for the plant to regrow new leaves develop strong roots before entering um, the, a period of dormancy. So not only is when grazing occurs, but opportunities for regrowth are important. So now think about that in sort of a visual diagram. Th this is what I think is most well accepted about when plants are potentially damaged by defoliation. So on the y-axis is this potential damage and it tends to be highest right at flowering seed set, and then it goes way down right after seed set into dormancy. And then also you'll notice that plants are not highly susceptible to grazing during green up or during growth initiation. So think about why is that? Why are plants not very susceptible to grazing during those early stages, during green up or growth initiation? We've talked about this before in class, but there's a few good reasons for that. First, the plants have very low energy demand at that point. They just need to keep their roots um, metabolizing. They need to keep their roots alive. And they don't have much biomass, so there's not a lot of resources needed to keep the biomass of the plant alive. So there's not really a great deal of carbohydrates needed to support that demand. So once a few green leaves get up after you get into the two or three leaf stage, the plant ends, it ends into a a positive carbon balance and they're bringing in more carbon through photosynthesis than they're spending. So there's pretty low demand. There's also abundant resources for recovery. That could include time. There's plenty of time to recover before the season gets bad. There's moisture. It's in spring. Plenty of moisture, soil moisture, nutrients. The temperature is favorable. And then also at that point the plant has meristems usually at the base and out of the reach of plants. So the animal, the plant has all the resources it needs for recovery. So in the spring, early at green up, um, plants have all they need to recover. They tend to get more susceptible to grazing as they start to um, produce flowers or, or begin seed set. So we, we'll talk about like the boot stage, plants go into this boot stage and then they start to produce flowers and then they seed set. During that period, they tend to be very, fairly susceptible to grazing. Why is that? It's kind of the opposite of, of why plants are not susceptible to grazing early on. At this point in their life, they have very high demand. They have energy because they need energy to support their stalk and many leaves, but they also need energy to produce seeds and flowers. Energy and nutrients are needed to you know kind of complete that life cycle. And the, at this time of the year, usually there's limited resources. It's starting to get hotter and drier in most seasonal rangelands. So that's why plants tend to be more susceptible to grazing or more susceptible to potential damage from herbivory as they produce flowers and seeds. Demand is high, resources for recovery are low, including time. Right after they produce seeds, they start to go into a dormant state. They, um, they, they, just kind of, they go dead, so they're um, reducing their amount of photosynthesis, but they're also reducing their demand.
So in dormancy, there's very low demand. Plants just go into that um, maintenance level, and that's um, a pretty low level. The leaves just have to stay alive. The leaves are stems, and then the roots just need to stay alive. Low demand. Okay, with those ideas in mind, knowing that we can control some impacts on individual plants, what would be the objectives of a good grazing management method? What do we want a good grazing management method to account for? There's a lot of different answers, but here would be some major ones. We certainly want to maintain plant vigor. We want healthy plants that produce seeds. Seed production is a kind of an um, indicator of, of health of the plant or vigor of the plant, so we often look at producing seeds. We certainly would want a system that meets animal production goals. Those production goals might vary a little bit from person to person, um, but we want a system that will meet those production goals. No doubt we want to make sure that the, the soil is healthy and that we're not doing any really fundamental damage to the land because we want to be able to graze from year to year. And then we also want grazing systems that control utilization patterns. Uh, when I was in school, we always talked about grazing methods that created uniform distribution patterns in that we wanted sort of the same amount of utilization across the landscape, every plant getting used roughly the same, and that was considered really good, that you were doing a good job in grazing management if utilization was even across the landscape. However, today we tend to think more about patchy utilization patterns as having quite a few ecological advantages. So depending on your goals, you might want patchy utilization patterns. You might want them to resist fire, intense fires that would seep, sweep across the landscape. You might want them to create different kinds of habitat for wildlife. Some wildlife like fairly heavily grazed areas that are have low plant stature. Others would want lots of plant stature. So lots of reasons why you'd want patchy landscapes. Some areas that are used heavily and some not so heavily across the landscape. Depending on your management goals, we can accomplish that with grazing methods. Um, and so it depends on whether you're trying to accomplish uniform utilization or patchy utilization. That in mind, we're talking about developing grazing methods. Now, those are part of a grazing plan. And over the years in this class, I've asked students to try to identify the major steps in developing a grazing plan if they were going to sit down with a rancher as a consultant or as a family member or as a range management specialist with an agency what are the steps they would go through to accomplish the grazing, the desired grazing um, methods. Here's basically what we've come up with. The first step is really to just figure out what we already know about the system. Research any past grazing history, any issues that, that the landowners had with the land. A lot of ranchers don't realize that if they're grazing federal lands, there's a whole file of information about every allotment that they manage. The past um, the past grazing history of it, the, there could be probably a significant amount of photos and um, other types of vegetation surveys. So there's a lot known about almost every piece of land in terms of what the grazing history is and what the issues on that land are. Somewhere along the way, pretty quickly, you need to determine what the conditions are, or resources that are available for grazing. What are the vegetation attributes? that can be used. Is it a woody system? Is it mostly grass? Um, is there a diversity of grass or is it a monoculture? Is it annuals? Is it perennials? Those things have to be known before you can develop management plans. And then the other thing you need to know before you start drafting plans is to really talk with a landowner or the land manager and identify the goals and concerns. On private land, uh, we can sit down and talk with the landowner. On federal lands, we need to follow policies and objectives in such things as range man or resource management plans, RMPs. Then the next step is to actually look at considering the grazing strategies that you could apply to address those goals. Um, make, keeping in mind that those goals would have um, impacts on wildlife, fire, weeds or invasive plants, um, water and water quality, uh, and soil health, a number of other attributes. So certainly you want to meet management goals, but keeping in mind that there are secondary effects that influence other attributes on the land. Next step would be to actually sit down and develop the plan. And a plan would include what type of animal, how many, 
when to graze, and how long. We talked about that before. Those are the favorite elements of a good grazing plan. On any type of land, you need to also consider laws and policies that, uh, that would restrict your opportunities, your options. Um, on, on private land, certainly got to think about the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act. Uh, there might be some zoning laws or rules. There might even be, um, if you've got a, um, an easement on property, those policies might need to be in considered. On federal lands, there's a whole host of federal policies. N National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, uh, the Federal Lands Policy and Management Act, FLIPMA, um, certainly the Endangered Species Act, um, a, a number of policies that relate more to, par to federal lands than private lands. And then finally, you've got things in place, you've established goals, you know your resources, you're going to explore possible enterprises, figure out what your plan should be, you're going to develop the grazing plan, that's the tactical side, developing enterprise or grazing plan. Make sure you have the resources you need to implement that plan, and then you need to monitor and adjust. Is the plan working? And replan if it's not. So the last step in any grazing management plan is to reevaluate from season to season every year while animals are out there before, during, and after to make sure that you're meeting the goals of the, of the plan. So bottom line, it's a... Uh, uh, not, it's not a prescription, it's an adaptive management approach. Make a plan, go out and see if it's working.